Hello, everyone. My name is Joshua Gilliland, one of the founding attorneys of the Legal Geeks. With me is Nari Ely as we continue to venture into the lower decks to discuss espionage, hazardous materials, duty to people who are visiting you, and all the other great issues in this episode of Lower Decks, which has the spy humongous. I, I can't help but think of like Mad Max, uh, <laughs> the road warrior with with the uh, the what with the way the packlets act, but that's just me that they're an advanced civilization that's super idiotic, mm -hmm. and that makes them extremely dangerous because they're morons with weapons. And I guess. <laughs> that's a horrible combination right there. So especially since they view everything from a position of strength as being good. Yeah, so I was going to say not only morons, but morons with the uh, moral maturity of, of small children. <laughs> what one can lack, in lack intellect while still having the capacity to try to be a, a good person and the pack lids that we have encountered thus far in Star Trek appear to have none of that. <laughs> Correct, because they're not smart. They're, uh, they seem to have failed the things you're supposed to learn in kindergarten. Be decent, they, they just don't roll that way. They and see things, they want things, they take things. <laughs> Again, a child with no moral upbringing whatsoever. Uh, we also learn a lot about uh, human behavior and brown nosing. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's a lot in this episode. What did you think of this one? I really enjoyed this one. I, I think that they did a good job um, addressing the uh, kind of, you know, a, a continuing plot for Boimler which is that he actually has this uh, ambition to move up from the lower decks um, and uh, compared to the rest of his friends. And this was a great episode for sort of exploring that. Um, and I really love that they also explored sort of, you know, what it, what actually gets rewarded um, and what will land someone a captaincy. And I really, of course, enjoy the moral of this story, which is that the actually doing a good job and thinking on your feet and taking action to help your fellow crewmen is uh, more valued than uh, getting, in, get, getting your face in front of the superior officer. Kirk, Cisco, Janeway, Picard, all got their hands dirty. Like they worked. They weren't schmucks trying to Peter principle their way up the food chain. And we see a group of young officers who believe in that. And uh, so again, nice little story arc there. But let's mm -hmm. jump into the legal issues of we have a diplomatic mission to Placklid Planet. <laughs> and uh, Freeman is a little big in her britches thinking like, like, you know, hey, this is going great for me. And, you know, Shat's thinking like, hey, you could get a enterprise level, you know, ship if you keep doing Picard type work. And, you know, they beam down. And after beaming down, we have someone who they think is seeking asylum. And, you know, credit to Ransom for being able to go, this guy's an idiot. But <laughs> I think he's asking for help. So instead of turning him away, they do try to verify is he actually seeking asylum? Yeah. So while we walk through the asylum rules when somebody shows up at our border, a port of entry, and asks for asylum, and a ship would count if somebody was at sea, and uh, we do have questions that are asked, uh, is it a religious thing? Is it a racial thing? Is it a sex thing? <laughs> and uh, take it away. 
Yeah, so um, this is obviously going to be a very broad overview. There's a lot of uh, devils in the details, as it were. Um, but in general, um, a, you know, any person who is on U.S. soil um, at a land border, at a port of entry, um, or potentially, as you mentioned, especially in these circumstances, on a starship, which, uh, you know, generally the laws apply of the flag that a ship is flying, et cetera. So, you know, this seems like it's not crazy that a starship visiting um, above the planet might count as a port of entry. Um, in any event, you can apply for asylum. Now, um, asylum is something that uh, is actually defined by law. So, uh, you know, a lot of the people or sources discussing refugee and asylum law are going to point to some of the treaties that the United States is a party to. Um, however, as anybody who studies international law knows, what matters is also, has it been codified? And the answer is yes. So the United States, um, since 1967, has been a party to the convention relating to the status of refugees. Um, and that was codified in 1980. Um, in the refu by the Refugee Act, which generally mirrors the same kinds of definitions of the really important stuff, especially the definition of refugee. So the definition of a refugee is um, not, not just anybody who shows up. So, you know, this is something that has come up in my, uh, contemporary political discussion. You know, what's on the Statute of Liberty uh, is, is a beautiful poem, but it is not in the Refugee Act. The Refugee Act has a very specific definition for what qualifies as a refugee. Um, and uh, in, in, I'm only abbreviating this slightly because there's another little addendum for people who don't have a nation. But um, any person who is outside any country of such a person's nationality um, uh, and who is unable or unwilling to um, uh, return to th that country because of persecution or a well-founded fear of persecution on account of, and there's a specific list of grounds that, that qualify a person for refugee status um, or asylum under the Refugee Act, and that would be on account of race, religion, nationality, membership in a, in a particular social group, um, or political opinion. Um, so it's th it, that's a pretty broad uh, a set of, of grounds for which a person might have a well-founded fear of returning to their country, um, but it is not uh, universal. So there, you know, if you don't want to return to your country because um, you have good reasons, but not reasons in that list, like it's just not as uh, generally prosperous, not as generally safe, um, you don't like it as much. Um, there are a lot of good reasons why a person might not want to, but they're not necessarily specified by this act. There's also a number of bars, so included within just the definition of refugee, um, you don't get, uh, you're, you're ineligible for asylum status under the Refugee Act if you have yourself, quote, ordered, incited, assisted, or otherwise participated in the persecution of any person on account of the same grounds. <laughs> that seems reasonable. Um, there's also a time limit. You have to apply within a year of when you last arrived in the United States, although you can instead demonstrate that you uh, deserve an exception to that deadline. Um, there's another one which is somewhat, con uh, per or I should say, particularly controversial because obviously a lot of these um, definitions and exceptions and bars um, are the subject of a lot of uh, debate, lobbying, politicking when, um, from both the peop uh, you know, people who are advocating for immigrants and refugees and people who are advocating to reduce the number of refugees that we take, et cetera. Uh, but so one of the more controversial bars is uh, uh, if a person has given material support to a terrorist organization. Now on its face, I think that sounds very reasonable. The problem is, is that in a lot of the anti-terrorism statutes, um, uh, they use the term material support. And in a number of these contexts, that term has been generally overbroad. It, it's very vague and it's been interpreted in very broad ways um, that would probably defy what a lot of people think commonsensically means material support. Um, in any event, I'll, I'll leave that to anybody who wants to research that more deeply. Um, but uh, that is one of the things that can disqualify you. Um, you do have to actually be, you know, in the in the United States or at a port of entry or at a border. Um, so, you know, you can't apply for uh, a asylum while sitting in your home in Argentina or something like that. Um, uh, in any event, as you were saying, Josh, I think that this probably qualifies, especially if this is a diplomatic mission and it's the closest starship probably for a sector <laughs> to the Federation. Um, and also, uh, you know, there's a lot of discretionary provisions in the act. So, you know, there's the attorney general and other people can always essentially grant 
uh, refugee status at their discretion. Um, I'm probably overstating it, but there there are a lot of exceptions that this the statute carves out at the attorney general's discretion. Um, I just want to note, so one thing that's also kind of interesting is uh, through other statutes, um, so the, the, the Refugee Act itself makes reference to, you know, at other laws that would be passed by Congress. Um, and one of those is the Immigration and Nationality Act, which does set out a ceiling um, for how many refugees the United States takes in every year. I won't uh, get bogged down in the details because I want to talk more about this particular pathlet, but I did want to mention that that ceiling changes year to year. It's proposed by the president, then approved by Congress. Um, and uh, it's varied quite a bit. So it was 70,000 in 2012, 110,000 in 2016. Now it's worth noting that there were um, thousands of un quote unquote unallocated <laughs> Uh, admissions during those years. So essentially, uh, less people actually arrived and then were uh, granted uh, refugee status or their applications were accepted um, than the ceiling. Um, but then that fell precipitously from 2016 each year onward until last year it was uh, 15,000. And in each of the last four years, there has not been unallocated uh, admissions. Uh, so it, it, this year, it's been raised to 62,500. We will see if there is extra room or not in that, because uh, obviously there's typically uh, a lot going on every year from which people might seek asylum. So that's a fun way of trying to avoid politics and describing what's happened. But elephant in the room, Afghanistan. So we had uh, translators there who helped us. That country collapsed and the Taliban took over. We have displaced people across the planet right now, and you know they they qualify under refugee status. Well, and specifically, Congress has passed statutes to uh, create additional, essentially, an additional visa um, mm -hmm. category for people. It's called the Special Immigrant Visa Program (SIV) for short. People may have heard about that on the news. Like, if you've heard of the term an Afghan SIV applicant, that means somebody who has applied in this special program, and it's reserved for people who have either worked directly for the U.S. government, worked for contractors that work for the U.S. government in Afghanistan, and the like. Um, so it's people who have, in some way, uh, you know, significantly worked for or aided the United States in their mission in Afghanistan. Um, and uh, I, so first of all, I actually, I don't, I, 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 I don't work for the U.S. courts anymore. I'm starting a new job in just a week or two. Uh, so I can't have thoughts and opinions again, <laughs> them, I suppose. Um, and, you know, I do think it is really important um, to, it, it's an issue that's very near and dear to my heart. When I was in law school, um, I volunteered for the Iraqi Refugee Assistance Program. Um, and it's, uh, you know, the process has, is, re is remarkably backlogged. It's been that way for years years. Um, there's just not enough people at the State Department to process the applications in a timely fashion. It's extraordinarily difficult for people in Afghanistan um, often to get the kinds of uh, documents that you would need to corroborate, um, you know, these sort of things of like, you know, well-founded fears um, or other documents that you might need, especially you know, because the Afghan government has collapsed. <laughs> so. Uh, in any event, um, there's a lot that the executive branch could have done, can still do to try to expedite the process. There's also things that Congress can do, including um, allocating additional funding um, so that they can uh, hire more people. They can bring back uh, so that the, the State Department can also bring back um, uh, former uh, State Department workers who worked in these programs and in intelligence to try to expedite that as well. Um, and there's a lot of appetite in the veteran and intelligence and retired <laughs> intelligence community, um, people who worked with uh, as many SIV applicants to do so, and I sincerely hope that uh, more action is taken to help them. Yes. Uh, we don't abandon people. So. Well, we did, but we shouldn't. We did. Which is why a lot of people are super upset. <laughs> um, and I, I, I know you, you said that, like, trying to avoid a political issue. I'm glad you reminded me that I, I can voice thoughts and opinions now. <laughs> not a terribly divisive issue so which it which i find refreshing um you know people on both sides of the aisle of both uh, red team and blue team are generally pretty pissed off about this <laughs> um and rightly so I, I remember in my childhood you know those escaping vietnam and landing in the san francisco bay area so there's a 
huge Vietnamese community in San Jose. And I went to elementary school with their kids. So yeah, like this is, it's a serious issue. We've dealt with it as a country before. Vietnam is an example of failure and that's a complicated issue. Uh, we won't get into the entire history of what went wrong, but. I don't think we have time to get no, to that. Just no, that, that, that was mistakes were made as, 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 as Reagan would say, and mistakes were made. Um, and here we are uh, after 20 years of trying to do nation building and we failed. And it's extremely upsetting. So, uh, cause I do think you know, women who achieve things like voting rights and or being able to go to school and learn to read have well-founded fears under the Taliban. So there, it's just, it's a very frustrating issue. Uh, that said, the fact that a comedy Star Trek cartoon addressed asylum issues uh, was probably unintended with timing, uh, but it is- an I, have to, I have to assume unintended with timing. Just, just because of the amount of time it takes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, but again, just with the release schedule, it, here we are able to discuss how asylum works because of it. So in contrast, I should say, to what's been going on in recent events, mm -hmm. uh, our PACLID friend, Josh, do you think he has a well-founded fear of persecution on a protected basis? No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I think it is honestly to the credit of the crew of Ransom that they even go so far as to ask, right? Because he didn't at any point say, I want asylum. He didn't say, I'm afraid to go back. I think the exact quote was, I like it here. <laughs> yeah. The ship is strong. So like they're, exactly. you could see him and the security officer going, huh? So they're, they're following their principles. So that's great. And they're verifying. And it's soon as trouble appears, like, like they didn't give them a tour of the engine room. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Frequently in Star Trek episodes, it's like, it's like Spacey, why did you give Khan the blueprints to the ship to study? It, <laughs> dude, so there are things like that, that you just need to have a basic understanding of security. And yeah, procedures and protocols, you know, these things are important. <laughs> so they're like, hmm, something's amiss here. And they recognize it. Um, I mean, the, the fact that the characters have a look at each other like, uh-oh. Like this is, you know, they're, luckily he's a moron. Yes. <laughs> what was the quote? We're not dealing with the Tal Shiar here. <laughs> no, no, this, they're not, they're not someone who's, uh, you know, the Romulan posing as a Vulcan, which seems to keep happening. Yeah. Know, like, yeah. Multiple, <laughs> multiple times. Uh, you, you think they would figure out, wow, that, why does Commodore O wear sunglasses? I thought the inner eyelid, they didn't need to do that. She's a Romulan. So it's just, it's just that basic little uh, uh, background check, you know, verify why would a Vulcan wear sunglasses? That said, they do decide to play him. And, mm -hmm. and being the comedy, they, they are having fun with it uh, until it goes horribly wrong where they lose him. So never turn your back and, <laughs> and never gloat because that's where things went sideways. Mm -hmm. so they kept their eye on him or if they had some other folks following him around, they would not have dealt with the issue of him disappearing. Yes. This is again, another place where a protocol would have been nice with, you know, a, just even one or two security personnel and their only job is to stay with him and be watching him rather than, you know, having a little whispered sidebar. Because <laughs> again, they've, it is hysterical. All the things that happen with them is hysterical. Uh, but like when he disappears, why is it the first officer and the security, you know, chief running around the ship, go to yellow alert. That was exactly what I 
was thinking. You need to have like just you know notify the crew we are missing a pack lid. It is extreme, you know security alert. <laughs> Find him. Yeah. On the flip side, I mean this could go to the larger issue of cover ups are bad. Yes, that's exactly right. Because is this the first officer going? Oh crap! Like this happened on my watch. As a and post- this is why Captain Freeman needs to set a better example. Yeah. Don't do cover ups. <laughs> You know, own up like, oh, crap, and learn from the boo-boo and move forward as opposed to, you you know, you lose a guy out the airlock, which raises the issue of the duty to guests. So when you, there are different levels as, as a property owner that you have to folks who are like in your house. Is it a business invitee? Is it a guest? Well, if it's that asylum seeker, I think, turned into a guest, which meant that there was a really high duty to make sure that he didn't get lost out in airlock. Now, this is where things get complicated because he's an idiot. So how idiot proof can you make your ship? Or do people get blown out of airlocks on a frequent basis? No. Yes, I, I figure this wasn't that an ord- person of ordinary intelligence would have mistook it for a bathroom. I figure there were many warning signs and <laughs> other things that he had to walk past. Yeah, when you close the blast door and you're now in an airlock and you can see... There's probably the, a big red button, for the protective cover. and. <laughs> yeah, it's like affirmative steps had to be made. It would be like, how did you accidentally trip the fire alarm? You know, how did you accidentally break the glass for the fire extinguisher? So it's something of that level of if somebody came into your house and you have an AED and they decided to take off their shirt and attach it to their chest and then zap themselves, that's, go, that's I would go, that's on them because there was a <laughs> lot of a lot of steps that a person of ordinary care would not have taken Mm -hmm. and how how much baby proofing do you have to do for the spy right uh and i just want to just because you just said it i just want to uh about uh highlight that that the standard in general tort liabilities to general civil liability is exactly what were you just saying um duty of reasonable care unless there's some other you know different standard that applies in a given context um and yeah what a reasonable uh ship steward let's say would probably not put uh the airlock in a position such that it is completely inaccessible even to someone who is absolutely determined to get there. Toddler proof. Is yeah. There, is there a way for a toddler to launch themselves out into the vacuum of space? Well, so the other thing is a toddler who is larger than a normal human and probably has about twice their strength, right? So I, I would bet you that a toddler could not accidentally get out the airlock of a starship at the Federation. No, no. There was- <laughs> <laughs> there, are, there are safety protocols. Yeah. It's, it's just, you know, it's like, so you put your hand in the garbage disposal and then you turned it on. Like, how did you, how? Yeah. <laughs> so we're at that level of. of I'm going to say probably they're not liable for this guy jettisoning himself out of the airline. <laughs> No, no. I mean, and I do love the security chief. Shaka? <laughs> that was great. I, I really love, by the way, that they brought that character or, you know, that they, they're, continu- they're giving these characters continuing appearances, recurring appearances, because I really liked him. I'd like to see more of him. Yeah, and I'm not sure who's the chief right now, because they, like, it shouldn't be shared. And... I mean, Shaq's being dead. It's like, that doesn't mean you get your job back. So it's like, you don't fire the new guy because the other guy came back from the dead. Um, So he might have another, be like an aide de camp Mm -hmm. type of role, you know, but again, he was uh, in charge of a shift. So like, maybe he's like third officer or second officer or something like that. 
So he's, I mean, like that would make sense if he's the second officer, mm -hmm. uh, but they still have him in yellow. So anyway, a um, lot, lot to unpack there, but let's get into the issues of espionage. Now we both yeah. hit this in our outline. Why don't you go first and talk, uh, address the, the law of war? Yeah, I think there's a very natural transition in here for you to jump in. Um, and I'll just, I'll cover this very briefly. Um, so for anyone who's a loyal listener, reader, follower of the Legal Geeks, we've talked a lot about the law of war and international law in a lot of different contexts. So the important thing to keep in mind is that at any time we're talking about international law, and law of war is no exception, um, we're talking about essentially sets of, of long established norms. They're subject to change. They're generally not written down. Treaties and conventions are the exception, not the rule. <laughs> um, so you know, always take that with a big grain of salt. But the under, under what is our, what are currently the long established norms, um, and you can evidence them with certain treaties that some parties are countries to. Um, most countries uh, have you know uh, military manuals that reflect some of these rules um, or what they view as the rules. Uh, so in, generally, under the law of war, someone who is captured by a country and is suspected or accused of espionage is not entitled to uh, combatant privilege. And combatant privilege is very important. It's when, so when two countries are at war and you capture an enemy soldier, um, you, under the accepted law of war, you, you cannot try that soldier in your civilian court for the things they did as a soldier, um, such as you know shooting your soldiers, which under ordinary circumstances, you would probably just call murder. Um, and instead you put them in a prisoner of war camp. Um, uh, in, in when, when, you f when, when it is found, when you believe that the person has been committing acts of espionage, um, this is an important exception to that. Instead of putting them in, uh, instead of giving them the prisoner of war status, um, you can try them for the various crimes um, that you believe they've committed, including you know, espionage, as usually there are various crimes associated with that or it, which encom are encompassed by that term. Um, it's important to note um, that again is reflected by a couple different treaties um, and by most uh, uh, countries' military manuals. You're still entitled to, if you're accused of espionage, even if you're a foreign citizen or even a combatant at a, in, in a war and you're accused of espionage, you're still not supposed to be summarily executed. You're still supposed to actually have some level of process um, you know, a, a right to a fair trial. I put that in, in quotes only because, again, this is international law. And so what that country considers to be a fair trial is ah, But um, you're, in theory, entitled to actually be tried for the crimes that they believe you've committed, as opposed to simply taken out and shot, right? Um, and uh, so if you are, however, accused of espionage, Josh, what are the kinds of things under, for example, in the United States, under our law, that would be included as espionage. And Nari will be right back because I hit the wrong button. Uh, but uh, sorry about that. I had you as the presenter. So. Oh. Um, well, since yeah. I was on my iPad, either people were getting to see, uh, you know, the latest Facebook page that I had up, or you were seeing nothing. <laughs> no, no, it just it just switched to me. So, uh, with that said, uh, there's a lot of espionage laws that we've had. We've enacted some during World War One, and that's the Espionage Act from 1917 that gets into uh, giving aid to someone um, wanting information about national defense. So if, they're, if it relates to national dis defense with the intent to injure you, the United States to a foreign nation, uh, in peacetime, that would carry a 20-year sentence. And in times of war, 30, or in the Rosenberg case, you know, executed. And the status with the pack lids is one of a quasi war, kind of like what we had with the Barbary pirates, uh, if not the quasi war of France mm -hmm. um, that that happened during the Adams administration. So that's a tough one because you can make an argument that there, since there are hostilities, 
and the diplomatic mission is to negotiate a ceasefire, uh, there is a actual state of war mm -hmm. between the Federation and PAC-led planet. So our heroes aren't trying to assist the pac -leds. So like none of our folks are on the hook for that. But having a spy running around, you know, trying to find out information about the Crimson Shields, you know, which is, again, brilliant callback to uh, TNG. Um, definitely, so we do have, you know, the, the Espionage Act on the table. There's also the Atomic Energy uh, Act as well that's kind of a, a cousin to what's happening. So that was, you know, came about... And especially in reference to his interest in the Warp Core, maybe? Yeah, Warp Core and defensive systems, uh, the codes... Uh, to the ship, all of that kind of smacks of why we enacted the Atomic Energy Act of 1946, which provides against providing foreign nationals any restricted data with the intent to harm the United States, uh, with a sentence for you know prison for life and a hundred thousand dollar fine. So yeah, um, that also gets into a definition of restricted data, which is what this dude was after. And that's anything to, about the design, manufacture, utilization of atomic weapons, the production of special nuclear material, uh, the use of special nuclear, nuclear material in the production of energy, but should not include data declassified or removed from the restricted data category. So thinking about what he's after, okay, they're not using nuclear power, but this is an allegory yeah. to what warp technology could bring, what the shields are, what the photon torpedoes would be, quantum torpedoes, if the California class ships carry those, uh, phasers. So it's definitely the spirits there. Yeah, I would be surprised if the Federation did not have analogous laws covering exactly the technologies that you're mentioning. Yeah, and that came about Cold War because for a while, we were the only ones with uh, atomic weapons. And then traders gave the information to the Soviet Union, and they had them too. So because the Russians couldn't figure out how to do it, but they could figure out how to steal it. So fun things about the Cold War. Uh, the Packlets are kind of like the Soviet Union. Uh, there were very smart people in the Soviet Union, but this would be like the version where everyone was an idiot in the Soviet Union and they're just trying to steal their way uh, into being a great power. Like, and can I also posit that the social instability that is evinced in the last five minutes of the episode may also be a little bit of a call to the history of the Soviet Union? Yeah, like what happens after Stalin dies and... Uh, or even just going to the as far back as the Bolshevik Revolution um, and the rise of the USSR and the communist regime in the sense of, aha, now we have revolted against the unfair uh, king and emperor and now power to the people. Ooh, that is is a really big crown. <laughs> Maybe I should wear it instead. Yeah, the I, I took a Russian history course way back at UC Davis. And you know, it was described as the uh the Bolsheviks won on accident. I like think <laughs> that like well if people had actually been on guard duty, that would not have worked. So there was that. And uh it was just like disorganized and somehow they won. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then we sent troops into Siberia. You know, we actually put troops in under Wilson, uh, the polar bear expedition, I believe it was nicknamed. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we actually invaded the Soviet Union and- they, I did not know this. <laughs> yeah, then left because winter is their main defense and mm -hmm. still. Um, yeah, so, but the Packlids do have that, we'll just steal our way, which was the early part of the Cold War that uh, the Soviet Union did uh, in copying aircraft designs and then weapons designs. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then a cavalier attitude towards human life for their space program. Uh, but I and animal that. life, actually, is yeah. a point of fact. There, there's some dead Soviet dogs in space, anyway. Yeah, we, 
we have different ideas of safety. So I think we've killed less dogs anyway. <laughs> we've killed less people. So, yes. uh, and all of our stuff was in public. There's a secret. So. Oh, and since I'm allowed to have a voice, thoughts and opinions again, I will just say that I, I remain optimistic that a society which encourages you know, free thought and free expression will always stay ahead in terms of our development of new technology and new ideas, even though others you know, can and will steal some of them. Yes, but yes, more to discuss for that bright optimistic future. <laughs> Now let's get to the, you know, there's the AB story and this might have an ABC story, <laughs> you know, cause we have the spy, we have what's happening on the planet and then we have cleaning up hazardous materials, the anomaly cleanup, which is a clever way to work in so much Trek references. It ain't funny. And they do, they, they have fun with that. And but, can I add that I thought it was just a really brilliant uh, encapsulation of what the lower decks are that you, you get these, you know, episodes of Trek that at the at the top level, what we usually see are these cool, you know, interesting characters finding cool, interesting things in space and then shenanigans happen and things go wrong, etc. But then what eventually happens to that thing which brought the disease to the ship or what eventually happens to those crystals and well, this is what happens apparently. This this episode had four storylines going, and it worked because two of them do merge back. So we got the cleanup crew, and they're doing cleanup, and it's a great way to talk about hazardous materials, which uh, and transporting them, which again, which would fall under the the purview of Secretary Pete Buttigieg. So I don't know how much time he's spent thinking about this, but. We actually have federal law uh, that's called the hazmat law. And we have rules about transporting hazardous material. And a hazardous, hazardous material means a substance or a material that the secretary designates under a specific title. Well, okay, that's not helpful. Well, let's talk about imminent hazard. And that means uh, something with the existence of a condition relating to hazardous material that presents a substantial likelihood that death serious illness, serious personal injury, or a substantial endangerment to health, property, or the environment may occur before the reasonably foreseeable completion date of a formal proceeding. Okay, so all these crystals have an imminent hazard to them. If it turns you into Fat Albert, it's hazardous. And I don't know if they were trying to make a reference there or not, but I just, I kept thinking, are they... Is it, does it sound like him? Like what's going on here? So uh, that's me being a 70s child. The other things that are going on with what happens with uh, like, you know, we have the flower that shoots spores. Uh, again, great callback episode to original series, but Mariner doesn't get punch drunk and you know in touch with her feelings. Um, she probably needs an ointment. Uh, they seem to have a lot of hyposprays handy. I assume she got a hypospray right after that. <laughs> Which means it's beyond reasonably foreseeable if they have an ointment on hand because they're not the first to yeah. you know, get turned into a cube and crushed. So, and the fact that uh, Tendi was packing a phaser also speaks to the danger that you're gonna need to arm yourself to clean out the senior staff's uh, quarters. So all of that's dangerous. There are cases where truckers and others have gotten into trouble. Uh, there's actually a published list of, of things that are hazardous materials and that they could be explosive, they could be flammable gas, non-flammable gas, poisonous gas, flammable liquid, flammable solid, spontaneously combustible, dangerous when wet, oxidizer, organic pesticide, uh, a peroxide, pardon me, poisonous in, uh, inhalation hazard, and, you know, catch-alls. Oh, and don't forget radioactive corrosive uh, as well. So again, clearly we're in this category 
where you're, they're putting stuff in jars so it could be sent away, so it can be disposed of carefully, kind of like how we have to get rid of asbestos pipes. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like you can't, like you need a team to deal with that stuff. Uh, and if you worked on asbestos cases, you see why, because that's pretty horrible uh, was what can happen to people. So that brings us to the red shirts. And I did break mine out. These guys kiss ass. That's what the, you know, they practice giving speeches. They don't practice the actual leadership of, are you willing to stay behind and, you know, fix the warp core so the ship can escape? Are you willing to do the things uh, that save others and that can cost you your life? Yeah, so in, in, in addition to, so, or just building off of what you're saying, it, it's not just that they focus on the brown nosing and ingratiating uh, things. It's, it's exactly what you're talking about with in terms of the speeches and also the makeover, <laughs> is that they're focused entirely on the appearance of being a great captain, on the superficial level uh, of being a great officer. Um, and if I can just, you know, uh, take a little dig uh, at, at some of the modern uh, Hollywood and, and television, you know, really focusing on the uh, what, what sometimes I think writers who don't have a deep love of Star Trek focus on, which is, you know, a, a long moving speech uh, that the captain gives to her crew before they go into battle or something like that, or a long goodbye because it's about to be a dangerous mission. <laughs> or, uh, when has that happened recently? Hmm, yeah. Uh, no, no, definitely not recently in Trek. <laughs> um, but I mean, that's exactly, I, I mean, but that's exactly it, is that those are, you know, very shallow level aspects of what leadership is or what leadership appears to be. And maybe sometimes good leaders do give great speeches. We can definitely think of great public speakers who are also great leaders in our real world and in our real recent history. Um, but that is not the touchstone. That is not what makes that person a good leader. Those are, you know, icing on the cake of what makes a great captain. It's good to be able to rally the troops. A good leader needs to be able to do that. To command, and, exactly. You have to be able to command people's respect and, and, and inspire them. That is, that's all great attributes of leadership, but. It's, not everyone gives the Steve Jobs inspirational iPhone rollout speech or getting people to accept pay cuts when he was at uh, the other startup he had after Apple, after they, they threw him out after the Lisa debacle. So, oh, head back. Anyway, long story. <laughs> um, Return to the Magic Kingdom is a good book. Anywho, there's when you look at all the old stories with Picard or Kirk or any of the you know great captains that we've seen in track, they work. They, you know, uh, put their lives on the line. It's not show up and look cute. And it's decisions um, that they make, sometimes very yeah. difficult decisions. So Janeway, whose name is brought up a bunch in this show, is, you know, has a very near and dear place in my heart in particular because the series Voyager starts off with her making a very difficult decision. It's literally episode one. Um, and it's a decision that haunts her for the remainder of the series. <laughs> um, and, you know, the, the response of the red shirts when there is a crisis is just to try to inspire others essentially to make decisions and to take action. <laughs> yeah, they never practice critical decision making. Now, how do you make a smart decision under stress in a dynamic situation where things are changing constantly? Because it's easy to play armchair quarterback, but it's super difficult to have the gumshoe to recognize this is what's happening, so this is what we need to do. Because mm-hmm. not everything's a nice controlled environment. If they were running holodeck drills with random situations that wasn't you know, playing thespian, but actually how do you handle, you know, like, oh, wow, is that an energy distortion? What could that mean? Like, they're not thinking that way. Mm-hmm. You know, they just, they want the look 
And it's like, oh, you're a glory hound. You know, Josh, I love that you just referenced uh, or, or threw in Thespian there because I now that I think back on it, I have to think that the writers here made, are making, we're making a very deliberate reference to acting and the red shirts being actors, um, especially with that scene where they're trying to get Boimler to give a, a moving speech. Um, and, and in the way that he pushes the chair forward, right, as a prop, they're all sitting in just folding chairs. It very much like workshopping someone practicing for a role. Um, and in the way that, you know, the, the scene sets itself and the lights come back on and it returns to reality. Um, uh, I have to think that was deliberate. And I think you're exactly right. And I hope that they also had in mind what I was talking about, that that's maybe what someone who's acting as a captain imagines like what leadership, because that's the part they generally get to do. They get to read lines off of a script. They get to give the motivating speech, but there's also this element to leadership, especially when it comes to military leadership, which has to be about making decisions <laughs> and taking action. Well, it's like, yeah. And again, completely different situation, but still the critical thinking, defend the deposition and be smart enough on your feet to recognize, hey, I need to make this objection at this moment in time. I have to figure out what's happening in real time. That's not easy. You can do drills. That's why you practice. And you know, but you don't, lawyers don't just practice giving closing arguments. Mm -hmm. You have to practice recognizing issues and being able to go, you know, hearsay. And if you're trying to get that statement in, is there an exception? And hopefully you thought about it in advance so you can actually make an offer of proof to knock down the objection. And every good lawyer also has a pocketbook of the rules of evidence, just in case. <laughs> this is stuff that takes actual study, practice, skill. And I want to also mention for you know people listening, who um, uh, many of whom undoubtedly are not lawyers, <laughs> um, there are judgment calls that people make it every day in their own lives and their own jobs that we would call leadership. Um, but I think what we really define leadership by you know, more than just being able to give it a, a moving speech to the um, to your employees at your franchise, for example, even um, is the ability to make is the ability to make decisions and judgment calls. So Josh, you were just mentioning like at a deposition when you're deciding to make an objection, um, you also have to make a judgment call about whether or not you take that to the judge <laughs> if something, uh, if the person does not back down, those kinds of things. Um, there are you know judgment calls that people make that are very significant to them in their, in their lives and their jobs. And those things are more important to a good leader than just being able to act the part. <laughs> or then sit there and look pretty. Like you actually have to know what the hell's going on and if you can't do that you know you're just going to show up and give a speech while somebody's turned into a scorpion and trashing the galley you know now they didn't go shoot her like so that's good that's, that's i mean that would be worse <laughs> so it would be just a bad judgment yeah yeah like that would be you now if the, the phaser was on stun like you could maybe make that work but uh you know you had Boimler realize again it's it's it is pure track what happens with him mm -hmm. uh, he asked did she touch an orb and it's like no a cube and he figured out what it was and then figured out how to help her I also have to say it was a beautifully structured episode where it goes right back to the first scene where there was just some uh, you know silly slapstick physical humor involving Boimler that Tendi laughed at that was really well done <laughs> Yeah, ex yeah, exceptionally. Uh, it's, I didn't catch that at 7 a.m. when I got out of bed. Uh, I did catch it the second time with like, oh. Very, very well written. Just that was, that was great. Yeah, it's very solid storytelling. Um, oh, and I want to highlight also, of course, the resolution of the redshirt um, uh, arc there, which I think Josh, you and I would, would 
agree was 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 beautiful because as we as we, I think we talked about a little bit in the last episode about what Trek means to to, to me to you um, you know one of the things that I think is really important that we generally believe about Star Trek and about Federation about Starfleet is that it really is a meritocracy that um, that they you know they won't be your superior officers will not be fooled by the brown noser who doesn't actually have um, guts doesn't actually have knowledge is just trying to act the part really well or ingratiate themselves. And in fact, in this case, they don't. Um, and I think that's something that's you know been true of previous Star Treks. Um, you know, we've as as Boimler pointed out very forcefully, you know, Riker did not uh, just brown nose and yes man to Picard or something like that. Didn't just imitate Picard. Um, he was his own officer and eventually gets his own ship. And that's true of most of the characters that we know and love from the various bridge crews. Uh, a lot of them get their own ships and we never see them doing something that I think we would call brown nosing or being superficial or having a makeover in order to try to improve their chances to get into the captain's chair. And uh, in Starfleet, you know, how, how you do your hair is just not important within regulations, is just not important to whether or not you'll eventually get in the captain's chair. Yes. Did you let your hair down? <laughs> so, exactly. Uh, it's, it's funny. It was President Theodore Roosevelt who introduced the merit system to the Navy. Mm. And so that's actually what in, helped in, because the people who were at Annapolis and becoming young officers at that point in time included guys like Nimitz, Halsey, you know, the people who helped save us from, you know, Imperial Japan. So worked out, worked out good. Uh, and seeing that system continue, that it's the person who, uh, like going for the Chief O'Brien, you know, and thinking back to uh, the, you know, uh, what um, it's, you know, Picard makes reference about uh, O'Brien making model warp engines, you know, and, and all good things. And so it's like, you like that type of person who, you know, keeps tinkering. You now, mm -hmm. warp is out practicing all the time. It's like, okay, we've got our strenuous exercise routine. Cool. Like, that's him. Calisthenics. Cling on calisthenics. Sorry. <laughs> Yes, hurts thinking about it, you know, and, <laughs> you know, Riker is kind of extreme sports and music. Mm -hmm. well, like, that's who they are. And I think encyclopedic knowledge of military tactics and history, though, which he has called upon a number of times, even if he doesn't flaunt that that's what he does. He's... So he's book smart, but also cool. Mm -hmm. so... Just like you, Josh. Good, good, good call. Thank you. I appreciate that. That was well played. Uh, but you, you can go. He grew up in Alaska, and he gets dirty. Like he, he'll, he'll go ride bicycles or whatever, and go out and have fun. And His then, future is is a cabin. So <laughs> yeah, and then he'll spend an evening reading. So it's just he, he's well balanced as opposed to, you know, someone who like does one but not the other. Like you mm -hmm. need both. Uh, in life, you should go outside and do things. <laughs> you, sh you should also read and study. So like it, you need both. And Riker does that. Picard does in different ways. So uh, also as a much older man, you know, we, you know, we do see him get stabbed through the back, you know, at a young age and in a bar fight with Noss again. So it's like, okay, so like he learned uh, and even as an older man, he does as uh, I think we've seen in at least one or two episodes. Uh, his recreation is horseback riding on the holodeck. <laughs> that and you know he travels with a saddle. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's just you, you're, that's oh, that's right. He carries the actual saddle, and everything else is holodeck. But he has his own. Yep, that's right. <laughs> and for the chance he can go actually ride a real horse, you know, he he has a saddle with him. It's like okay, like that's his game. That's cool, but it shows that they're fully functional characters. They're not studying some other dude or gal. Mm -hmm. you know, or spending all of their time picking out clothes and cutting their hair. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm not opposed to a makeover. Like it's okay to shake things up to show that you're dynamic, but if it's just superficial, there's no there there. Yeah, 
Yeah. And if it's also, and this is one of the things that I love, right. Is that it's, it, or about Trek is it's, you, it's, there's no problem in Star Trek with trying to do things that, you know, for yourself, if you want to change your hair, you change your hair. Characters have changed how they appear during the series. Um, you know, probably for other reasons behind the scenes, but at some point Deanna Troy gets to change the way that she looks. Um, and it's, it's not, it's not a problem, but she doesn't change the way she looks in order to imitate someone in power that she's hoping will give her favor. Yeah, it would be interesting to track the uniform versus non-uniform looks that she had and what was the motivation. So the and maybe thinking if I'm not in uniform, it's easier for, for people to talk to me as a counselor. Like that could be, but she also does, uh, she'll suit up other times. Mm -hmm. and, and for Picard's wild side, he did ram, uh, you know, use the Enterprise as a battering ram. So like he does, he will shake things up. So, uh, but again, you have to uh, be true to thyself. And Boimler learns that. And he inadvertently gives a speech. He, a lady wants to now hang out with him mm -hmm. to go see another one man show with the guy that they keep referencing. So, you know, there's playing all of Jupiter's moons. Okay. So again, great. This was a great episode with lots of legal issues and it's pure track. Yes. It is. As always, this is the most true to Trek thing currently on television. We'll see what happens uh, when, when Strange New Worlds comes out and if I amend that statement. But for now, I'm very comfortable saying that. <laughs> uh, I concur. <laughs> and we'll keep it positive. <laughs> yes, yes. J just highlighting how great this show is. That's all I'm saying. We won't talk about the thing that we're comparing it to without actually naming it. So uh, that said, let's- uh, Oh yeah, and the last reference, do you want to mention it, Josh? Because that was freaking hilarious. Oh, uh, the skin of evil? Yeah, yes. that was, talk about a deep reference. Yes. So, <laughs> and, and if you follow um, uh, Denise Crosby on, on Twitter, like she's had a bunch of recent jokes about that as well. So like the, again, airy timing, um, you know, what, about that. And the fact that they went there, uh, the, okay. That planet would be forbidden. So like there's warnings, don't go there. So that yeah. means it's gotta be taught. You know, like, hey, this is a place we don't go because we got it. We had an officer killed there. And, you know, so we got this black sludge and it's totally, you know, it's, it's a killing machine, so we don't go there. The fact that they decided to crank call him and just toy with him, brilliant. Absolutely yes. deep cut, brilliant, go tool with the skin of evil. Deep satisfaction also for those of us who were, you know, very upset with that character even after the fact. <laughs> so the, uh, I highly recommend an episode of Monster Party where they did an interview with Denise Crosby. Mm. And uh, she's a neat lady. And hearing her talk about her time on Trek, going to shows, what Trek means to fans, she is just so appreciative and just a wonderful person. So mm -hmm. I recommend that episode because it's, it's, granted, it's epic because they talk about everything from Pet Cemetery and you know, the fact that she's the granddaughter of Bing and um, uh, a lot of jokes about her Playboy episode. So yes, so there's all, all good things there. Um, Just wanted to make clear, people who are upset with the skin of evil, not, not with Tasha Yar. I was very sad no, no. that Tasha so, Yar died. <laughs> yeah, killing her. Yeah, that just great character, great character. Um, and the way they bring her back in yesterday's Enterprise, also fantastic. Also, her relationship with Data. Really, I, I love the way that they brought that in in his trial as well. <laughs> Very moving. They were intimate. So uh, with that, everyone, thank you. We'll be back. And this was a special Thursday one, but we'll be back next week as we continue into our journey into the lower decks. So thank you all. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay geeky.